veseli smo, da imamo med seboj avtorja odmevne knjige Ekonomija dobrega in zla, ki se po svetu prodaja v sto tisočih izvodih, upamo, da v Sloveniji v nekaj tisočih, pa vendar odpira ključna vprašanja v svetu, kjer toliko govorimo o krizi, toliko govorimo o ekonomiji in takoj prvo pomislimo na številke in včasih pozabljamo na človeka. In na vse dimenzije, ki so v tej besedi vključene. Tomaš je izjemen poznavalec ne samo ekonomije, teorije ekonomije, temveč tudi zgodovine, filozofije in to izjemno dobro povezuje v svojih knjigah. Zato predvsem pa, kot sem tudi že njemu povedal, prihaja iz srednje Evrope, iz prijateljske, sorodne države, lahko bi rekel celo bratske, bratskega naroda. In v tem smislu mislim, da bomo celo malce drugače pristupni, kot pa če bi tukaj sedel, ne vem, en gospod Jeremy Hitz ali nekdo iz Severne Amerike ali iz Velike Britanije. Tako da, kot poznavalec pa je vsekakor se kosa z največjimi tudi drugot po svetu. Tako da, prosim, da ga prav lepo pozdravimo z močnim aplavom. Hvala lepa. Torej bom pa mogel prevrati nekako kratko, kratek življen je pis Tomasa Sedlačka, on je pač češki ekonomist in univerzitetni predavatelj, že pri 24 letih je deloval kot svetovalec Vaclava Havla in vedja za enega najbolj prodornih mladih ekonomistov na svetu. Od leta 2011 dalje dela kot makroekonomski analitik za Češko centralno banko, predava na Karlovi univerzi v Pragi, piše kolumne in je priljubljen radijski in televizijski komentator. V pogovoru ga bomo spoznali, njegovo misel, njegovo razmišljanje o sedanjosti in o prihodnosti, preko pogovora z doktor Marjano Kost, magistrico Marjano Kost, po izobrazbi je ekonomistka, leta 26 ki je opravila magisteri na Schumacher College v Veliki Britaniji na temo denarja. In se veselimo torej tega pogovora in pa predajam besedo. Hvala. Ljubljana. I always wanted to come here, but I never had a proper excuse until my good book got published here, so this is a, a, a good excuse. Um, yeah, this is sort of in some countries, for example, in Netherlands, I'm a philosopher, which is nice. And in Belgium, I'm more co connected with the artsy people. And in Switzerland, I have very frequently theological debates also in, in, in Germany. So it really depends on the time of the day and in, in which country I, uh, I find myself. Um, it was turned into a theatre play, not by me. This was done yeah. by artists uh, from Brno, which is a small mm -hmm. town in, in Czech Republic. But uh, they offered me if I want to play there. And when I was seven years old, I wanted to be an actor. And uh, in my life, I managed only half because I became an economist. Uh, but <laughs> but uh, so I said yes. So then we toured not only Prague, uh, sorry, not only Czech Republic, but uh, many European cities with, with this theatre play where I get to be uh, playing myself, which is very easy and difficult at the same time. You can't really hide behind a, a fictional, fictional character. But I basically what I did in my book, I uh, connected everything that I like. I connected economics with philosophy, psychology, mythology, theology, poetry, 
I put a Matrix into it and Lord of the Rings and I mixed it somehow and uh, I thought I would be the only one who would enjoy this and I discovered that there are many other people uh, who, who, who enjoy this way of um, you know, thinking perhaps. Uh, so you say the purpose of the book is, I quote you, to look for economic thought in ancient myths and vice versa, to look for myths in today's economics. So which are the myths that you are talking about? Oh, so uh, I start with the Epic of Gilgamesh. This is the oldest story that we have. Uh, in this story, there is not single times money is never mentioned, um, nor is there any violence in this story. It's actually quite a beautiful story. If, if you think about it. Uh, but uh, that would require a special, special lecture, so I will use, uh, let's say, Christian uh, stories or, or poetry or, or imaginary or mythology, which we, which we know from the Bible, if I, if I can, uh, and show you what happens when an economist reads the story of creation. Yeah. So, um, uh, the fall of human being is uh, the leitmotif of, this, of the story of, of creation, the story of Genesis, the story of, um, about the Garden of Eden. And um, in traditional theology, uh, the fall was associated with sex for reasons unknown. Um, sex is never mentioned in this story only once, and that's in a positive, positive connotation. But as we all know, uh, we are all tainted by the original sin because our parents, as hard as it is to believe, actually had sex before we were born. And just by this quote and unquote dirty act, we came to the world dirty with the exception of, you know, immaculate conception of, of Jesus Christ. So everybody else, um, there was sex involved. Uh, so this very strong belief originates from the original fall in the Garden of Eden. Well, when you look at the text carefully, the word sex really doesn't appear, but another word appears 23 times in one and a half chapters, which is two pages um, of, of, of a book, and that's the word consume. That word is repeated 20 over times don't consume, it was nice to consume, she consumed, gave Adam to consume, Adam consumed, why did you consume? Da -de 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 -de. So, I mean, if you ask me, repeating one word 20 times on the span of two pages, that's, that's bad literature, until, of course, you have a point. So, the original, so this is an, another layer of interpretation, the original sin, it wasn't a sin of sexual nature, it was a sin of consumption, because sola scriptura, they consumed something that they were not supposed to consume. And even I could say that it was a sin of overconsumption, because they didn't eat it because they were hungry, or because they had to, it was eaten out of some sort of excess. So, and the curse that Adam and Eve receive is also economic nature, uh, because it seems as if God is saying, because the enough that I gave you of everything wasn't enough, nothing ever will be enough. And this is, you can fast forward all the way to the year 2014, we still feel very similar to that story. That story suddenly has a huge relevance to us. And the curse is also interesting, the curse that Adam and Eve received after they were expelled from the Garden of Eden. You know, in economics, everything is about demand and supply. So, uh, Eve gets the curse of demand. You will desire, but your desires will not be with you, your desires will be elsewhere, your desires will be disjointed, they will be in control of you, you will not be in control of them. And Adam gets the curse of supply, <clears throat> you will work in the sweat of your bra, and even with the technology of the 21st century with all the cameras and internets and Wi-Fi and Hi-Fi and, and, and Bluetooth, how, no matter how hard you work, uh, it will not be enough to satisfy all the newborn desires. So exactly sort of a copy-paste of the situation today, uh, you know, even according to eco many economists, this was one consensus that we had 
for uh, in a long time. What led us into this crisis was was overconsumption. So this is one way to spin the story of, of Eden that makes quite, I mean, at least for me, it makes um, economic sense. Another way to spin it is that um, uh, even in the Garden of Eden, so what I do is I try to look for ideal places on Earth and in the fantasy of mankind. So I search myths, I search stories, I look for how elves lived in Tolkien's Lord of the, Land, Lord of the Rings. And one of the most beautiful ideal societies is, is Eden. This was freshly created by God. Uh, sin hasn't entered yet. There was enough of everything. There was only one woman in the whole world, which you know simplifies things tremendously, <laughs> and uh, and only one man. So you know, <laughs> um, and you have a direct access to God and he's walking and talking with you, yet we read that the first feeling that Adam feels was loneliness. Adam felt alone. Uh, so how is this possible? God creates somebody, we don't know exactly why, but most likely to have a relationship, and in that relationship one person feels alone. That's not a very good uh, result. I mean, if my partner feels alone in that relationship, uh, not so good. So, uh, as a response to loneliness, God creates him a helper, a suitable helper, but helper, which is a little bit weird. I feel alone, okay, here's an assistant or, you know, some sort of a equal, equal help. So, uh, the, the, so first, Adam feels alone, um, and second, he feels psychologically castrated because obviously God is telling him that whatever it is that your job is, you need a helper. In other words, you're not doing your job uh, well enough. You need somebody to help you. So the first situation that man finds himself is overemployment. The task that Adam had was higher than, than what, he could, what he could cope with. Um, so what's the point? The point is even if we economically manage to reproduce the situation in the Garden of Eden, in other words, economically have abundance of everything, ecologically this was a beautiful garden, still no CO2 emissions, psychologically no Oedipus complexes running inside of your soul, uh, theologically or religiously direct access to God, nobody will ever be closer to God than Adam, yet Adam feels alone. Uh, and the whole Bible is actually sort of a history about God and human being trying to sort of find the way, miserably failing every time. So if you feel alone in your life, it's okay. You know, um, uh, relationship is an illusion of um, uh, unloneliness. So, but no, but this is this to me is even uh, you could even use this as a critique of, of of Marx, because Marx, for example, criticizes that capitalism alienates uh, human being from other human beings and that it alienates the, cre uh, you, you, the worker from the creation of his hands. These are the two basic alienations that Marx used to attack capitalism. My point is, well, you know, okay, but you are not attacking capitalism, you are attacking human condition. Uh, alienation with the work of your hands, God felt that. He creates a human being and that human being alienates himself immediately from the creator. So this is, and this was thousands of years before capitalism was even invented as a word. So that's a condition of our material world. It's a, it's a human condition that uh, Marx could not solve by criticizing capital or changing the, 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 social, the social structure. It is something that um, you feel and hear uh, across all cultures, even in the Epic of Gilgamesh, the alienation of a man from himself and from his fellows and from the work of his hands is, is quite evident. So um, it was an absolutely misplaced criticism, a mistake that um, should never be repeated. Okay, okay. well, if I uh, go back to your this uh, proposition that the original scene had the character of overconsumption, now you had some other um, thoughts around that which I found quite interesting. So you say, we can go even go as far as to say that discontent is the engine of progress and of market capitalism. 
and we are by far the richest civilization that has ever existed, but we are just as far from the word enough or from satisfaction, if not further, that at any time in the distinct primitive past. You say that demand simply creates more demand. Yeah, we thought that demand wants to be satisfied. No, demand wants to be reproduced. This is actually, I have this actually interestingly enough from Slavoj Žižek who says the, the, the original intent of desire is not to satisfy the desire but newer and better desires. And you can see this quite nicely now that we have 25 years from the fall of the wall. This is a historical event that most of the audience I can see remembers. How many things did we desire 25 years ago? And today, do we desire more things or less things? Even though today we are unimaginably richer than 25 years ago, nobody had enough fantasy to just even picture a fraction of how affluent and effortless um, our lives will be, yet we are not, uh, the, 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 the set of things that we want is not smaller, but even, even perhaps bigger. So in other words, so let me now go from the Old Testament, from the Hebrew tradition to the Greek tradition. And in ancient Greece, there were basically two schools trying to answer the same question. You can see how Hebrews answered this question of discontent and how, how, how Greeks did. So the school of, uh, uh, so there was a basic agreement that, you know, and again, in economics, everything is about demand and supply. So I desire this, but my supply is here. Now, what to do? So stoic, uh, so hedonists uh, or utilitarians had this program, if you want this much, but only have this much, then work harder so that you increase your possessions, your supply, until you have everything that you want to have. So supply should rise until it meets the demand. Uh, this was a school that we have followed for the last 2,000 years, more or less, uh, but instead of supply, just add GDP, and this is the situation today, we still need this and this and this and this. That's why our GDP has to grow. It's even a religious belief of the society today. Um, uh, and at the end of the day, you will have a content person who has as much as he or she desires. Okay, so this was hedonists. And then you had the school of Stoa, uh, who said, okay, we agree with the initial analysis, I desire this and I have this. How to solve it? Their answer was decrease your desires. And uh, at the end of the day, you will be a content person. Now, this seems an easy thing to do, but it obviously requires um, uh, something that very many human beings or perhaps even all human beings are unable, unable to do. If uh, you want to escape this into um, a psychological or religious world and say yes I am that person I don't I am happy with what I have congratulations I think sometimes our prayer should be let uh, you know may I desire the things that I have not the things that I don't have which is normally we don't once you have it you don't want it anymore well, you, you don't you don't you know you it doesn't give you utility but uh, this is also true knowledge-wise. Nobody will admit that I have enough knowledge. Everybody wants to have more knowledge. Or if you ask the most religious people, I don't know, St. Teresa or Augustine or, or whoever, are you spiritually grown up enough? They will always say, no, of course. You know, the more I know, the less I know. And uh, my heart will never be rest. And my heart will never rest until it rests in you. So um, it's a human condition recorded in the oldest of teaching, this engine that, uh, it's an engine of discontent that drives you further. And it's okay, um, but if it's discontent, this tension between I desire and I have, that drives us forward, then we shouldn't complain that we are not content. 
It's one or the other. You know, either we're discontent and we use that as an engine and we should be grateful for our discontent, but you mustn't expect to be content. If you want to be content, then fine, but you are, uh, then, you know, progress will, will, be, will be completely different dynamics. So my point here is that what we are actually expecting of economics to tell us today in the year 2014, um, philosophy or theology uh, was already solving at the very beginning of their existence. Uh, at this point, I would like to touch on a, uh, an extreme that you mentioned in your book, uh, and um, it was a very interesting example, that is Mandeville. You say that um, he actually claimed that greed is the necessary condition for progress of a society, sort of what you just said. And uh, you say, according to Mandeville, we should be grateful to vice and immorality for full employment, lively trade, and the de facto basis of the wealth of nations. Now, would you agree with him? Because if I think, for example, how we calculate the GDP, where uh, oil spills add to the growth of GDP, not to mention wars, for example, and many things which we value, like family and uh, yeah. you know, childcare, often don't uh, yeah. contribute to GDP. So would, in that sense, we agree with Mandeville? Well, in certain, in certain points, he is, he is right. But he, fundamentally, this argument um, um, the argument is faulty before the brackets. This statement alone is, is valid, but it's the sort of the broken window fallacy. Uh, but let me, let me maybe demonstrate a sort of an, another way of, you know, an, an upgrade argument vis-a-vis -vis Mandeville. Now, Mandeville was before Adam Smith, and Mandeville was the one who wrote a very controversial book called Feeble of Bees. How private benefit, uh, sorry, how private vice becomes public benefit. So this is sort of the pre-image of the invisible hand of the market. This is exactly the opposite of what St. Paul is talking about. The way the invisible hand of the market works is that you enter the black box with egoistic, malicious desires. Something happens in the black box and a good result comes out of it. This is the title, private Vice, through the magic of the market, become public good, public benefits. Bad intent, good result. Ironically, this is the only combination that economics has focused on. We are trying to be a rigorous, we're trying to even be a rigorous science, which is, which is funny, but let's say that we're trying to be a rig rigorous social science or even better for me, rigorous humanity si uh, discipline. But surely there are other combinations as well. I mean, I want to do evil, it ends up well. Or I want to do evil, and it ends up evil. Or I want to do good, and it ends up good. And I want to do good, and it ends up evil. So economics became sort of a cynical religion where we believe evil intent through the magic of the market will bring good benefits. And good intent, you know, this is the traditionally, you know, the road to hell is paved with good intent. So it's an extremely cynical uh, discipline where we only respect sort of egoistic intent, which my first point. My second point, we only study this one combination. We don't study the other combinations that are, of course, empirically likely. And this is where St. Paul comes in the letter of Romans. He says, I want to do good. I, have, I, I plug good intent. But, damn it, I end up doing evil. So the uh, Mandevillian invisible hand of the market is exactly the opposite. I want to do selfish. I don't want to care about anybody else. But, god damn it, I did it again. I contributed to common good. But, um, uh, the way we grow is, is, is in, a way, in a way interesting. Um, uh, I have this very quickly, I have this theory about the wave of growth that, you know, a wave forms at the expense of the surrounding water level. So if you form a wave, the surrounding water level, of course, goes down. Now, my question is whether our growth is a little bit like that. And I say, well, we have tunneled the past, fossil fuels, um, that is, in a way, solar energy of the past conserved in, in, in petrol and in, um, in, in fossil. 
we are burning that. No generation before us burned that much of energy. Uh, and imagine how our GDP growth would look like without petrol and without fossil fuel. I mean, it would be no, no airplanes, no cars, very slow trains, uh, or perhaps even no trains, and GDP would be basically much, much slower growing than it is. So that's one way how we are taking the energy of the past. Uh, we are also taking the energy of the future. This is how economies have been growing also, by debt. I take the money, this is you know, the sort of the trivial argumentation, I take the money from the future and I invest it now, um, taking the energy from the future because I, sooner or later I have to pay back the money and the energy will be missing. I'm taking energy from the past, we are taking energy from the future, we are taking energy horizontally, uh, this is how Europe has grown, we have been a very aggressive superpower. Today, many Europeans think that you know we are the nice, postmodern, you know, very sort of culturally sensitive, mm -hmm. you know, postmodern da di da di da. And America is the brutal, ignorant, um, imperialistic, local culture destroying, uh, into capitalism enslaving mm -hmm. ideology. To which I always say, as a European, I always says, yeah, 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 yeah. But you know, you're not comparing. You're not comparing comparable. If you want to comment on America as a superpower, you should compare it to Europe when we were a superpower. We're no longer a superpower, so you know <laughs> this is not really a fair comparison. What did we do when we were a superpower? We literally, intentionally, systematically destroyed local cultures, not by accident, but by a program. We literally stole the gold and silver, and we literally enslaved, not in some philosophical, sociological, oh my God, you know, I feel enslaved by capitalism. No, we literally <laughs> enslaved people who sort of died very often on the way in the ships that we were shipping in. So we were a very brutal superpower, and where would Europe be if it wouldn't be for this horizontal exploitation? Uh, but that happened in the past. It's also happening a little bit in the current, of course, not in such a violent form. But only one sentence because I really need to, need to get to the point. Uh, international trade is very beneficial for the poor, yes, but it's much, much, much more beneficial for the rich. So a nice example of, this is, I think, some, this is a very trivial example, but it shows nicely how market structure works. Let's imagine that here in Europe, you are ready to pay 100 euros for a kilo of good coffee. Yeah, this is the price here, and this is... So now, somewhere in, I don't know where, Africa, a local farmer is willing to sell that kilo of coffee for one euro. Now, what should the price be? If the price that the poor guy gets is, is 100, then we as a rich society will simply have a wider variety of coffee, but it will be same price. In other words, we will save nothing, okay? I will still pay 100 euros for a kilo of coffee, but this poor guy gets 99 new euros because previously he only got one euro. So the benefits of international trade will be with this person. If we say the price should be 50, 50, uh, 50 euros, the coffee in Europe will be suddenly costing 50 euros, and that means I save 50 euros and I can spend 60 euros on cigarettes or alcohol or, or, or whatever. And this guy gains 49 euros. So that will be sort of, okay, that you know, makes sense. But of course, do you know where the price ends up in, in Realpolitik? the real price will be 1.0001. Why? Because we are price dictators. We can walk to somebody else. We are a monopsony. You can easily imagine this when you travel to a poorer country. Let's just imagine that you travel to a poor country and you go to the market and there is this guy who says, so where are you from, my friend? He is asking, there's not only to be polite, but also to determine your price level. Yeah? So you say, I'm from Ljubljana. 
Oh, okay, Ljubljana, so pre- Okay, <laughs> yes, so for you, special prize, loaf of bread. What's a loaf of bread here in Ljubljana? He, I don't know, he knows. <laughs> So you don't know you don't do bread. No, I bake my own. <laughs> you bake your own. Okay. Do you sell it? No, I don't. No. Okay. Uh, so let's say I don't know two euros. Two euros. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So special price for you, my friend. Two. No. Euro fifty. You know, good deal. And you know that the local price of bread is ten cents in this poor country. And you immediately storm out at him and say, "You thief! How dare you!" Uh, try to cheat me. I know that normal price of bread is 10 cents and you're trying to rob me and sell it to me by uh, 1 euro 50 and this poor guy said no, but you know, what do you mean? You've been paying 2 euros for a loaf of bread all your life Now I'm giving you a nice little 20% discount and you are calling me a thief? <laughs> Who's a thief here? Okay, now philosophy and ethics to the side, who will win? You will win because you can walk to another. And you will walk long enough until you find a person who's willing to sell it to you for 10 cents. So we, so the poor benefit from the international trade, but the rich or the powerful benefit much more. So that's the energy that we take horizontally. And then the last sort of energy also of GDP growth is innovation. I call it um, vertical, because it's like mana, it drops from the sky. Some years are better, some years are worse. And we, we invent a cell phone and GDP grows. Now, my thesis is that in three of these four dimensions, we are running out. We are running out of petrol and f- f- fossil. We have not run out yet, but we all know that we are, sooner or later. Yeah, this is one argument that it took a long time for economists to sort of get the argument that if there is a limited of something, it will run out mm-hmm. sooner or later. Also, debt is running out. Greece, uh, even, 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 uh, yeah, even America, even European debt. We can no longer drive our economy on future money. Um, globalization has not run out yet, of course. But we know that it will probably not be as steep as it has been through our generation. And innovation, this is the only question mark. This will probably continue, but it's a hope. We don't know. It might just be that this is it. You know, it will, you know, it will never come up with a battery that will last more than a day. Maybe. Of course, I hope, I believe, I pray. But uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a hope. And then there is an, so my thesis is here, of course, yes, our growth has been, as a wave, we sucked the energy from these four dimensions, and uh, they are running out. Three of the four are definitely running out. That's why everybody's, even politically or economically, so much talk about innovation. This is the only hope that we know might carry for longer. And then I realized there's a fifth dimension of economic growth, and that's ourselves. Take an example of communication. 20 years ago, communication was a non-marketable dimension. In other words, uh, in other words um, when we talked, we didn't use money. Like you, when you bake your bread, you don't sell it, you don't buy it, you just do it for yourself. And it's very nasty of you because you, we don't see that in GDP. You know, you're stealing from Slovenia. I, 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 I buy uh, the flour from... Okay, Canada. at least the flour, but you know, uh, <laughs> you should really pay yourself for the work that you do. That's a great that idea. Would be, that would be nice. Yeah. That. <laughs> uh, should uh, I pay taxes on that as well? Of course. Uh, and, and the value added, don't be cheap on yourself, you know. Uh, uh, so, 20 years ago, we, communication was a private domain. It was not a domain of the market, so to speak. Of course, from time to time, we sent letters and we had a you know, phone call, but 90% of the conversation was without the market. You didn't need money for that. Today, 90% of your communication, you need thousands. You know, it seems easy to call my mother who is, let's assume, in China, which is a nice thing about economics, you can assume anything. I am employing thousands of people just to make that, that phone call. And by the way, a small little thing, uh, you're not talking to your mother. 
you're talking to a piece of technology. It sounds like your mother, <laughs> but it not, it's not your mother. It's you're actually talking to machines, you know. Um, but what's my point is this this um, monetization or marketization of communication has oh that's a terrible monetization of communication has been a huge source of GDP growth but it had a price we pay we have to pay we pay for communication uh, and of course this could be go on, go on for dinners for example we still like yourself cook dinners the moment we stop cooking dinners to ourselves but we start selling dinership GDP will grow cleaning of our homes this is also going uh, in the way of the market bringing up our children etc 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 so um, that is a fifth dimension I would say selling not in a negative way but giving to the market what was not markets originally so um, this is the fundamental characteristic of GDP. This is how GDP looks in the kitchen, behind the scene. In front of the court, I mean, in front of the um, curtain. curtain, thank you. In front of the curtain, it looks like, a, it looks like our number, that Slovenia in 2013, we managed to do plus 0. Point whatever, 7%. But behind the scenes, you see all these mechanisms going from the past to the future. Um, it's a beautiful multi-dimensional machine. So that didn't answer your question, but I hope it was at least yeah, well, distracting. I, I forgot yeah. all the questions. <laughs> good, good. This was exactly my point. <laughs> okay. Good well, answer is that the uh, person who asks the question forgets about the question. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so you do suggest that actually we live in a debt age and that GDP is actually a gross debt product. Yeah. That we yeah. live on debt. Yeah. Um, and uh, you say, you mentioned also about growth, uh, but you do say that the problem with, it's not capitalism as such, but it's actually growth capitalism, that growth yeah. is a problem. Yeah. In, in my reading, this is not a crisis of capitalism per se, it's a crisis of growth capitalism. The real and only problem actually, really to economists, is that it doesn't grow. Everything else is... Now with Piketty and others, we are slowly opening our eyes and saying, oh, equality? What? What, what does that mean? Do you have a dictionary? What, what do these people want from us? Mm -hmm. In the past, they always wanted growth, 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 and now the problem is that we can't come up with, with growth. So, um, um, uh, uh, I gave this example today about this gross, domestic, gross debt product. Um, when I take a loan of 10,000 euros, only a fool would say that I'm 10,000 euros richer. You know, this is complete, st completely stupid to think that. Yeah. But when a government does exactly the same step, government takes 3%, borrows 3% of GDP, invests it or gives it into the economy, and the economy, let's say, next year grows by 3%. Everybody, even Harvard, MIT, Yale educated economists, stand up and applaud and say, Yay, hallelujah, we are 3% richer. No, we're not. It's, you know, it, it, and this is where I suggest instead of GDP, gross domestic product, and I don't know how this will translate into Slovenian, but it's, it's very funny in English. Uh, instead of g GDP, gross domestic product, we should keep the abbreviation, but we should call it gross debt product. And we should really rejoice. You know, hooray, our gross debt product has grown by 3%. So this is another way to show how we are fictionally taking energy from the future. Okay, but you are proposing some... Um solutions or solutions or you do have proposals regarding the GDP and how we should actually calculate it and also on personal level um, your Sabbath economics proposal okay yeah so my first question when it comes to GDP and all the G happiness indexes and everything my of course my first philosophical question is why do we need to calculate it 
I mean, at the end of the day, what good does it bring? Can I do a little test on you? Okay. Your, your, you personally, your personal GDP, in other words, your income, in the year 2013, first quarter to the first quarter of 2014, right, yeah, just the year 2013, let's keep it simple, inflation adjusted, did your personal GDP go up or down? Who knows? <laughs> did your income in the year 2013 go up or down? You know, you don't have to tell me, but just raise your hand if you know. So, okay, now by how much? And I want it exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and I want it exactly like we do GDP, that means to the decimal point. Zero. <laughs> okay. Without decimal points. Does anybody actually know? I have asked now 3,800 people by now. I always, whenever the question comes up, why I always ask, okay, let's really have a look on how GDP is really, really important and how much is mythology. Uh, and nobody knows. And, and my typical audience are auditors, bankers, advisors, financial people, people who deal with money on a daily basis and they calculate GDP and GNE and inflation and all that dooby dooby doo eight hours a day. <laughs> nobody, I've not met a person who would say, yes, my income went up by 4.2%. I've not met one. And then I always ask them, okay, so nobody knows. Now, por qué? Why don't we know? Is it difficult? Is it technically sort of, you know, oh, I'm not sure. No, you just call your accountant. Of course, your assumption that your accounts reflect the level of your income, um, which, which is, but let's assume that your taxes actually reflect your income. And you call, or you, or you look on your tax return and you see, okay, last year this, this year this, divide one by the other and multiply it by 100. Everybody can do that. So that's what, five minutes? Look for the paper, four and a half minutes, and then half a minute to do the very difficult mathematical calculation. What's my point? We don't know, not because it's difficult to know, we don't know because we don't care. We don't care. So this is sort of my little demonstration of showing on the personal level, which is much more important for you, your personal GDP, than some abstract GDP of Slovenia, which has quite frankly very little to do with you. Or even worse, GDP of Europe or you know, of the universe. And what magic happens between when it's actually important and we still don't care, to, and then there is some, something happening, something I can't really describe, Personally, I call it fetishization. And that number for Slovenia or for Europe becomes something, if it falters a little bit, we dismantle European Union. Or we kick Greece out. Or we shoot somebody. Or uh, I don't know. You know. So this, to me, is my way of answering this, uh, this weird, uh, weird thing called, called GDP. Now, I'm not saying that your income is not important. And I'm not saying that GDP is not important. I'm just saying that uh, it's not as important as we think. Um, so in your life, your income is important, absolutely, in mine, absolutely also. Is it the most important thing in, in your life or in my life? No. It's importance, I don't know, priority number seven, eight, nine, ten, in, with our level of income. E e e even, yeah. So. Um, that's sort of a more fundamental answer to, to the GDP question rather than how to calculate it so that it involves you know, the green trees and, and the pleasures of... Okay. of uh, yeah. That's not what I meant uh, with the question, but yeah, I do agree that GDP is... It shouldn't be as important as... Yeah, let's keep the statistic, of course, but let's not fetishize it. And you're actually saying that in economics it's, it's become basically about econometrics, about mathematical calculations, uh, and that it lost its its soul in a way. So what do you think economics needs today anyway? So this is interesting. I, I sort of hear the same complaint that we have from capitalism, uh, also uh, against European Union. The structure is there, the institutions are functioning, the bureaucracy is, you know, the law is kept, sort of, but the spirit is missing. 
And you have this against capitalism, and we have this also against European Union. Uh, so it's like a body without a soul. Um, and okay, now changing the topic, we've done theology, blah, 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 blah. Now let's go to uh, a very, one of my favorite things is connecting high culture with low culture. So now let's plug in um, horror genre into this debate. Why horror genre? Because this is a very good example to show what happens when you separate a body from the soul. Uh, so in the classical horror movie, a body without a soul is a zombie. So the, the scary element is that my close friend, um, whom I've loved all my life and find, find her fascinating, suddenly is no longer herself, although the body remains, and she, usually it's a she in my case, <laughs> always, uh, <laughs> attacks me. So you are no longer you, but you, you attack me. This is what, so the body of a zombie is very, very efficient. Uh, why is it efficient? Because every adult has a basic dilemma. Do I eat or do I multiply? At the end of the day, you can shortcut all the dilemmas that an adult human being has to sex and food. Now, zombie is very efficient because this basic dilemma is non-existent. They multiply by eating. So it's, you know, it's, it's a very efficient, very efficient machine, but not efficient the way we would like it to be. And this is also sort of a, I use a lot of footnotes in the book because you can see that this, you know, everything is related. So a little footnote here is economics is all about efficiency. But the purpose is missing. If, uh, if you ask me, is this pen efficient, I would you know, try to write with it and I would say, yes, this pen is efficient because it writes well. But if you ask me about, is this efficient, and I don't know what it is, then I would say, well, in order to answer your question whether it is efficient, you would have to tell me what is the meaning, what's the purpose, what's the, in, Ara in, in, in Arabic, in, uh, in Greek, Tell us what's the Aristotelian purpose of, and then oh, also oh, oh, this is not a ship, this is a lid, and let's see. Oh yes, it is an efficient lid. Now the problem with economics is we ask about efficiency, but we don't know the tell us. We don't know what the meaning is. So in other words, it's like a zombie that is very efficient at working, but we but the wrong direction. Or, 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 or zombie is a very efficient tool, but yes. Um, so uh, this is how we feel about economics today, that it's a very, very, very efficient body without a soul. But my point is altogether slightly more complicated, I hope. When you separate the body from the spirit, the zombie is not the only scary element that you get. You also get the ghost. And ghost is a spirit without the body. Now, ghosts, in all the horrors that I've, and I've probably seen them all, for scientific reasons. Uh, this is the beauty about my job. I can go midday into movies and actually don't have a bad conscience because I'm, I'm working. Um, <laughs> Ghosts work like this. They don't directly attack you. They just, they just stare. Was I scary enough? <laughs> no. Well, no, no. Okay. You have to have a little bit. I would have to have a little no, bit of. I think you've been too, too nice so far. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But the spirits, the, the 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 machine which spirits or ghosts use is blame. They just stare at you and notice that in all these horror movies, there's. It's, it's basically a work with blame. They blame and they look at you and they drive you crazy. You jump out of the window, you slice your, slice your wrist, or you know, this is, doesn't really matter. Now, my thesis is in separating the body from the spirit, which was done both by technical men but, and by religious men, uh, the religious spiritual despising the body, the body despising the soul, we have in our culture divorced the two, so people read the Bible as a religious text that has nothing to do with actual technical functioning, 
and vice versa. We look on economics as a boring thing that doesn't have any ethical, you know, it, that is full of ethical voids. Absolutely not true. These things will always have zero meaning, even the most brilliant theology or even the most brilliant mathematical economics. There, it will be meaningless. It will be, it will be absolutely harmful if these two are, are divorced. And one other answer, if I may, uh, this is the most radical, um, the most radical way of answering the question is, we don't have a goal for capitalism. If we had a goal for capitalism, I could answer the question whether it's actually efficient or not. We don't even have a goal for European Union, but it's a little bit easier there because with European Union, at least the founding fathers left us with a little bit of a goal and that goal was peace through trade. That was the meaning, the purpose, the telos of, of European integration. So in the year 2014, we can actually sit down and say, do we have peace in European Union? Yes, we do. For the longest period of time in the history of Europe, we've actually had peace. No European Union country has fought other European Union country. Of course, there's been you know, all sorts of separates, you know, da -da -da, but not a war. So mission accomplished. Question number two, do and mark here that the original founders had peace as the ultimate goal and trade was a what we call in philosophy um, tra the diminishing uh, mediator, the vanishing mediator. It's just a secondary objective. We only use, it's a ladder. You don't use the ladder for the ladder's sake. You use the ladder to climb up to the tree. And once you, like Wittgenstein says, once you use the ladder, you let go of the ladder. You don't carry the ladder with you. So trade. Do we have trade? Well, depends. One way to answer is yes, absolutely, we have trade. The north of Finland is trading with the south of Greece with an unprecedented ease. And I even put it in poetry. Uh, we've never even, they even have the same currency. Finland, Slovenia, and Greece have the same currency. You have the same administration. You, have, you, you produce something that's good enough for Slovenia. It's good enough for Greece. It's good enough for Finland. This is, um, I always, because I come from Czech Republic, and this is a country of Eurosceptics. And I'm sorry for spoiling it for everybody. I am the biggest Europhil in Czech Republic, which isn't all that difficult. But I, but I am. And uh, always people scream at me complaining about European Union. And I say, okay, we don't have time to go through all of your list of complaints. So pick the most important one. And let's focus on this one. Bureaucracy. I say, okay, bureaucracy. Good. So, dear sir, or all of you here, how many times did it happen to you in your personal life that European bureaucracy has stopped you for five minutes? Can anybody, and, and, and so far I've not asked 3,800, but I've asked maybe 400 people, and nobody uh, actually said, oh yeah, 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 I had to fill in the question. No, European bureaucracy didn't stop anybody that I know or asked for, for five minutes. So again, this must be some sort of a myth, but this is a, this is a, this is a different, different topic. So we have peace, and we have trade. Now, the problem with peace is that peace is a stationary quality and you can't maximize it once you have it, and trade is not. You can trade more. This is the uh, meaning of, of GDP growth. But one way to answering, this is, a, I, I repeat, this is the most radical way of answering the question, is I could say, yes, we have a depression from Europe, we have a feeling that the soul is missing because the goal has been accomplished. And if you want to go further, then we have to have new sacks for new wine. Otherwise, it's not going to work. So if I'm going to visit my grandmother, I can only take a car here, and from here I have to walk or take the stairs or do something. But I can't really blame the car for not being able to take me up the stairs. Now, the more difficult case with capitalism. Capitalism was not really constructed as carefully as European Union, so we don't know the, the aim, the meaning of, 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 of capitalism. But let's just for a second assume that the meaning or the home run of capitalism is to make 
vast majority of people in a given society not having to worry about their existential needs. In other words, and that is my suggestion for a goal of economics. In other words, you can take your children to movies three times a month without worrying that at the end of the month you will have nothing to give them to eat. This I suggest as a nice uh, sort of goal for economics or, or capitalism or whatever. If we take this as a work in progress goal, then also I'm afraid to say, well, in most countries, especially here in Europe, mission accomplished. Um, not, in, not in the poorer countries of the world, this is where we should... I think our happiness would be much better if we actually focused on somebody else than ourselves. It's very difficult to make a European child happy. You would have to give him, I don't know, a new iPod. I, yeah. It's very difficult to make a European child actually go, whoa! It's very easy to do that to a poor children somewhere in the other, other parts of the world. So, to end the question, um, I, was just, I was just in Austria, which is the country, um, in, <laughs> in, in Aubach, and there was, there was this forum, and I had a similar question, and there were all these cows around me. It was a beautiful scenario, and I really love it there. So I said, it's a little bit maybe like a cow. You're milking a cow, and the cow no longer gives you any milk, and you start hitting the cow. Oh, you know, you terrible cow. You know, you're not giving me any more milk. And let's just imagine for a while that the, like, like, in, like in Oedipus, uh, like in, uh, like, well, the cow opens its mouth and says, but why are, you, why are you hitting me? Look around you, look at all the baskets full of milk. The, the basket that you're milking me is already overflowing. That basket is rotting. That basket is empty. I mean, that basket is um, leaking. That, that fourth one, you don't even know where it is. The fifth one, um, uh, you've just kicked it over even without noticing. And I already gave you all my milk. Uh, care for what you have, I can't give you any more milk. So this is sort of the most radical interpretation of why the spirit is missing, because it already fulfilled. And if we want to go further, we, we have to change the vehicle or, 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 or change the, the, the purpose. Okay, thank you. Uh, I was warned that it's already five o'clock, so uh, I was just thinking if anybody from the audience has any questions. Um, any? Do we need to give you a mic? Yeah, okay. I, can speak loud too. I think it's because of the recording. I have two questions for you. The first question is about GDP. You said that GDP is not the measurable criteria about wealthness among the countries. What measurable criteria would be for wealth? No, no, no. I didn't say that it's not a measurable criteria you said it's of wealth. It's overpriced. It's fetishized, yeah. Okay. And my second question is connected with wealth. You were talking about monopson in globalization or the trade. Uh, what would be your prediction, not on external market, not on international market, but on internal market? For example, for Slovenian market or Spanish market. I'm talking about Monoxon. Uh, we have 160,000 unemployed person. How far can companies dictate, we're talking about private data, dictate the salaries, the wages? What's the bottom? Both questions are connected with wealth. Yeah, uh, so the first question is no. I mean, GDP is, I mean, I, I respect it, only we misunderstand GDP. GDP was never me meant to measure happiness, or, or, or GDP was originally and still is meant to measure economic activity. So when there is a leak in, uh, in, in the oil barrels, economic activity goes up. But of course, it's a disaster. Or, um, or uh, my, I have a suggestion: if you want to increase your GDP, cut down all your trees and sell them to Austria. We're doing. Right. <laughs> oh, you're doing it already? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but now I can't say. The, I can't finish the sentence. No, we are not cutting. We have okay, a good. lot. So, but we are selling them. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or ban children from going to schools and go make them, you know, produce. Yeah. Sorry. Well, we have many times that 
why GDP is not important? Because the people's happiness is not incorporated in this measurement. Yeah. So we have to focus on people's happiness. I cannot agree with this thesis. I'm repeating to be my question because you also mentioned happiness. Yeah. Yeah, but that's exactly why I went through so much pain to give an answer with asking you. I'm not saying that your income doesn't, uh, is not calculated correctly or that it doesn't contribute to your happiness. I never said anything of that. I said none of you care about it. And that's my point. So, of course, you can make the measurements more. You can include the beauty of the horses or the quality of the beer or the quality of the air, whatever. I'm, I'm not, you know, make it. It will be a better measurement than GDP because, again, GDP was really not made to measure happiness. Um, this, it was made in the time where people didn't care about happiness. Uh, this is also some, something that's quite, 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 quite important. My point was, why do we have to measure it? This is why I, this is, we're never going to be able to measure happiness exactly. Uh, and I would even claim that we don't want to, uh, deep down, uh, to measure that. Now, your other question, dictating, dictating prices, um, um, I don't know. I mean, uh, if you are a private person, it, yeah, this is a, this is a complicated. This is, of course, a complicated question. But um, um, well, who else is there to dictate the price? It's sort of you know you well market. I I also employ people. Yeah, I have I have three four employees. And I come to them and say, you know, I'm interested if, if you want to work for me. And I offer you, I don't know what, 28,000 euros an hour. And you say, rubbish. You know, I want 30. I say, oh, okay. You know, in an ideal situation. Uh, and, of course, this is sort of the, 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 simple, the simple case. Then you have the minimum wages and, and all that. And then you have the trade unions come into it. But, you know, the trade unions only speak for people who are already employed. They don't speak for people. It's like in Czech Republic, they wanted students to pay for uh, tuition in universities. And, you know, of course, the stupid person went around asking students, would you like to pay for your school? No. no. And I said, OK, don't ask the students. Ask the people who want to be students and ask them, are you ready to pay for tuition? Providing that your probability of getting into the school increases by, I don't know, 30% because there'll be more, more, more. That would give you a completely different, completely different um, answer. I think it's wrong if unions disallow people who want to work for lower salaries. I mean, that I think is, is wrong in the same way that it is wrong when an employer massively misuses his or her negotiation skill against his own workers. Both of these extremes, I, 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 I think, are wrong. Any other question? Okay, I will just repeat the question so that everybody hears okay. it. Yeah. So you, are, you hear me, all right? I hear you all right. Okay, so Thomas, you mentioned um, you mentioned that we should be focused on the least developed part of the world, right? But what would be, uh, because there is no such thing as an as a instant solution to a society to get rich. It's about the people themselves, their creation, their level of, of uh, productivity. At the end, uh, also, having to do with, uh, with, um, um, with those uh, social notions that uh, the, the uh, wealth creation has. My question would be, what, where do you see uh, the way to improve the, the level of standard in the least developed countries in the world, actually? Doing, providing them uh, monetary monetary funds wouldn't work. It hasn't hasn't uh, um, um, uh, uh, turned out as a good way. Yeah, you know, um, uh, I don't know whether this is also a saying that you have here, but in in in, in Bohemia, we have a saying: if you have an enemy who's hungry, give him a fish. If you have a friend who is hungry, teach him how to fish. I don't know if you have something like that. Who? Lao Tzu, Chinese. Yeah, but he said it later than we. The secret history of the world yeah. from the yeah. point of view of Bohemians. Yeah. Um, so, um, um, uh, how to make them better off again? <laughs> 
Yeah, 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 yeah. I understand. So I was in Berlin. And we were talking about cryptocurrencies. My point is, everything is a cryptocurrency. And then they asked me, what would you, if you could design a currency, what would you design? And I said, you know, how far, how crazy can I go with an answer on a scale of one to ten? And they said, twelve. I said, okay. So this is the most crazy answer that I could come up with. And um, it answers your, well, sort of, these questions can never be answered this easily. It's, it's a very good question. And I hope you don't expect a simple, simple answer. But I was thinking the other day, now please be patient with me. In the beginning, this is going to sound extremely ridiculous, but towards the end, it will be better, okay? <laughs> Currencies are printed by central banks, and they represent some movement that is very difficult even for economists to understand. And in fact, if you ask an economist what money is, you said you studied money. Mo then tell me if I'm wrong. Most or all economists will actually, at the end of the day, say we actually don't really know what money is. Even if you read Zimmel, what, 800 pages or so? It's, it's a really, really, really big book. The advantage of my book is that it's really much shorter than Zimmel's um, Philosophy of Money book, which is about the only advantage that I have. Um, but um, after reading that book, you will not know what money is. Okay, so my suggestion is how about we consider for a while, and this is where it gets really romantic and nostalgic and ridiculous, smiles. Just imagine for a while that human happiness, represented by smiles, so this answers a little bit your question too, would be the currency. Immediately, you would have massive ways of investment into the poorer parts of the world, such as some parts of Africa and some parts of India, because it's really the return over investment is much cheaper there than in Europe, as I already said. Making a European brat happy is very difficult. I know it with my own son. Come on, let's go to movies. No, not again. <laughs> he even once told me, you know, we were having a quarrel, and he's very clever, and, um, and, and we were, you know, I wouldn't allow him to do something. And he said, you know, I'm really mad at you. I said, okay. If, you know, if, if you don't allow me to do this, I won't go to movies with you next time. <laughs> and I said, what? You, I mean, and now I realize that, you know, you're doing me a favor by watching McDo I mean, Donald Duck. And anyway, so just imagine for a while that um, into the existing uh, capitalism structure, you wouldn't have to change really anything. You would take the skeleton and only instead of money printed by central banks, you would have smiles. So... Everybody would have his own sort of money print, and uh, the economy would suddenly follow much closer by really trying to make people happy. And then this friend of mine, who is an expert on cryptocurrency, said, yeah, wait, 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 this is not as crazy as you think. This already works. I said, what do you mean? Well, we now are working on likes. You send a like, and you automatically send 0 0.001 penny. Uh, one cent of euro. So an artist or a, 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 some, you write a comment or you put a picture or anybody that makes me happy or aware of something that I appreciate, I send you a like and you get 10,000 of these likes and you have your monthly income, whatever. And you can send your likes to other likes and basically at the end of the day, this is what you do. I like a cheeseburger, your like goes and it is followed by a monetary transfer, so of course, you no longer give him money. You like a Jedi. You have these cards here in Slovenia as well, the, the touchless, the contactless. Yeah, you like a Jedi. Oof. You know, and you pay. Uh, so, so point number one. And secondly, I realize that this is in fact the currency that we use with each other when we have a non-monetary relationship. So for example, our relationship, we've met one and a half hours ago, is non-monetary. You're not paying me, I'm not paying you, we are here on human basis. And we uh, pay each other with, with emotions, with smiles, and this is also how you treat your friends or your family. You actually want them to be happy or, or realize something or actually have a positive emotion. So if that would be the case, and perhaps in a most um, radical of the worlds we are even moving into that direction, then your question would be answered by the market mechanisms themselves, 
only you would plug it from here and, and plug it somewhere else. So again, an answer that I'm not really suggesting, it's crazy on the scale of 1 to 12, but at the end of the day, it, there is some, uh, something that at least gets us thinking and maybe somebody of you or invents something that actually could be useful. Well, uh, last question. Uh, your book is or was a quest for economic meaning. So have you found it? It can be just yes or no. <laughs> yeah, I always, because always towards the end, the moderator gets nervous and says, okay, now we only have time for two other questions. And I always say, no, 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 the questions are not the problem. They are usually brief. The answers is, 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 is the problem. So, yeah, to me, an economic meaning is... Uh, is, is we should put economics to where it belongs. It shouldn't be telling us values. It shouldn't be, uh, because for me, economics is a, moral, is a very moralistic religion. It tells you that egoism is okay. It tells you that you will live here because of your utility, that you have to increase it, that you can actually approximate human behavior by mathematics. It gives you moral imperatives such as consume, such as enjoy, such as um, calculate, etc., etc., etc. It also has good ethics, this emphasis on freedom, for example, or this emphasis of being responsible for what you do personally. On the other hand, it teaches, we teach our students not to be responsible for the deeds they do because this is the invisible hand of the market. So follow your own thing and don't care about the impact of your work that is being masterly taken care of by this invisible. So it's an extremely irresponsible and cynical uh, moral school. Uh, and we shouldn't... So, okay, no, I have a good question. Uh, the, the meaning in economics, we shouldn't read so much meaning as our generation does. In the past, we killed each other over religious issues. In the medieval, towards the end of the medieval time, we would, you know, cut each other's heads because of the way a baby or an adult was supposed to be baptized. What? Today you go like, what? Why? This is so irrelevant. Two generations ago, we killed each other over wanting to have more uh, Lebensraum. I mean, today, if I offer to Slovenia half of, I'm not going to pick on any particular country, but let's say half of the other country around you, you would say, you know, we have enough of our own troubles. Why, why, what would we do with, with the other half of Alps, for example? You really, we don't care. It's a dead fetish. But two generations ago, we literally uh, killed each other over it, uh, tortured each other, cut each other, other heads off. So there was a fetish of religious beliefs, then there was a fetish of, let's say, geographical and national beliefs. Both of them are dead. And now, don't get me wrong, I have nothing against the idea of a nation state. I have nothing against religious beliefs. Like I have nothing against economics. I love it. This is why I'm an economist. This is why I'm so critical, because, you know, from a literature critique, you don't expect him or her to hate literature. This is my, my case. I'm an economic critique exactly because I love it. Uh, if I'd be a philosopher, I would make fun of philosophy. If I'd be a theologian, I would make fun of theology. But I'm an economist, so I make fun of myself. This is the only person that I can make fun of. This would be otherwise extremely stupid and easy. Um, so if I am to sum up my... That, uh, that was actually a good question. I, th we didn't prepare this question. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I the, the meaning... I'm just joking. The meaning, the meaning, uh, the meaning of economics is not to take so much meaning from it. It's like when you're reading Future from Coffee Stains, and again, I have nothing against Coffee Stains, but don't put too much meaning into it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.